Hello, and welcome to Sleep Unplugged. My name is Dr. Uh, Chris Winter. I'm a neurologist and sleep specialist, and this is episode eight, Why Nobody Cares Your Child is Sleepy. Really excited about the podcast, really excited about uh, the momentum that we're seeing here with this. Uh, really excited you could join us today for what I think is a very important topic. As in previous episodes, uh, we will uh, start with uh, corrections, uh, gaffes from previous episodes that we've picked up on. I think so far, uh, last episode that we did on um, uh, insomnia, I, I said sleep apnea at one point when I meant insomnia. I think most people got that the slip of the tongue. Uh, the other one was I mentioned some work that I'm doing for sleep.com. Uh, doing a show called Sleeping Around with Dr. Chris Winter, where I spend time sleeping with individuals who sleep in unusual circumstances. The most recent episode that came out was the 24 hours I spent with the Fort Worth Fire Department. And in the episode, I referred to them mistakenly as the Dallas Fort Worth Fire Department. And let me tell you, that is not a cool thing to do. Uh, so I have apologized. I've told those guys the next time I'm in Fort Worth, I'm coming to the station. Station 17 is the, the station that I was uh, was at, and I am doing the dinner dishes. They have this really elaborate, cool thing I'll talk about maybe in an upcoming uh, podcast, sort of a behind the scenes of those episodes that I did on uh, sleeping around. Uh, but they have a very cool ritual that you do to see who does the dinner dishes. And so you don't have to do it that night, fellas. I will be down doing it. So it is the Fort Worth Fire Department, not the Dallas-Fort Worth Fire Department. Uh, something else that I sort of want to correct is that we're here uh, kind of flying through these episodes now. And I, uh, episode seven, and have not mentioned uh, my daughter, uh, Maeve Winter who's really uh, was the reason why we got this started. Uh, she produced, produces the episodes, uh, does a lot with sort of getting the word out there, got me established on all the different podcast platforms and drew this awesome logo, which I think is fantastic and probably belongs on a t-shirt. Uh, she was a graphic art major in college, uh, studio art major, did printmaking and uh, interested in psychology and so just sort of sort of pushed a lot of buttons in her world so I really appreciate your help with getting this project off the ground maybe should have thanked you a long time ago and your ongoing support um, we're going to talk about narcolepsy today and disorders of hypersomnia in kids I want to give a couple of disclaimers I, I try to be very upfront about uh, my conflicts of interest um, I'm not being paid by anyone to do this podcast, which is extremely liberating <laughs> and nice. Um, I do uh, receive money from sleep.com, which I have mentioned uh, the sleeping around episodes, which has, this is a separate uh, endeavor. Um, I also am employed by several pharmaceutical companies to consult with and speak on behalf of their medications that they use for narcolepsy, idiopathic hypersomnia, excessive daytime sleepiness. So I'm not gonna res I'm not gonna really talk about any specific therapies today in this in this episode. Um, but I do want to put that conflict of interest front and center. Um, and the reason why I do that sort of work is that I think you'll see at the end of this episode, I believe very strongly in making people aware of the condition of narcolepsy because it is a unique entity that I think deserves a lot more attention uh, than probably what it gets. So we'll 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 deal with that. So let's talk about narcolepsy and, and specifically narcolepsy, excessive sleepiness in children. When I wrote my most recent book, and you can follow me and we'll post all kinds of extras and interesting little things on uh, DR Chris Winter. That's my Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, D-R-C-H-R-I-S-W-I-N-T-E-R. -E my two books, The Sleep Solution, Why Your Sleep's Broken and How to Fix It, as well as uh, The Rested Child, Why Your Tired, Wired, or Irritable Child May Have a Sleep Disorder and How to Help are both available. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle, Audible, uh, all over the place. If you need it, you can find it. 
So I, I want to talk about narcolepsy, and, and the topic of the show is why nobody cares that your child is sleepy, which I think is probably a true statement, um, and it's true for a lot of reasons. And so I want to get into what narcolepsy is and then talk about why it's such a unique challenge within the medical field. So narcolepsy, this comes from the, the Greek word narke, which means seizure or stupor, lepsy, uh, another Greek word, the root means attack. So it's a literally attack of sleep or attack of stupor, um, was sort of coined uh, in 1880 by a French physician. He was treating a, 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 a guy who sold wine, a wine merchant, who would have these attacks of sleep 200 times a day, which is a lot. Um, and so the condition sort of became, grew in terms of its acceptance and its awareness. We worked out underlying pathophysiology of it um, for a long time. It was sort of an autoimmune model, the HLA-DQB1 uh, asterisk 0602 was the gene locus we always talked about. That was the board exam question you had to memorize. But as time has passed, narcolepsy has also acquired um there's an idea that there's also potentially autoimmune uh, modulations that are autoimmune conditions that can happen to create the uh, disorder. There's a famous uh, outbreak in 2009 after an H1N1 vaccine seemed to indicate that individuals getting that vaccine may be more at risk for developing narcolepsy. So, um, so what is narcolepsy? And I think this is probably the most important part of the episode because I'm gonna say the word narcolepsy and I want you to think about what comes to mind. If you're of my generation, perhaps it's River Phoenix in my own private Idaho. Uh, maybe you saw a movie with uh, Mr. Bean playing, an ep uh, playing a character. For, for the younger generation, um, Lemony Snicket, um, that the uh, series of unfortunate events, uh, there's a character in that uh, book series that had narcolepsy. So narcolepsy is out there it's usually a funny character that adds texture uh, to some sort of, of movie or book um there's certainly music about it and we'll reference a couple uh uh music groups that that had songs named narcolepsy in the in the in the in the 90s at ben folds five uh and third eye blind so when i use that word it's going to elicit some sort of image in you and what I want you to do, your, your homework for this episode is I want you to erase that because the image that I want you to conjure up when you hear the word narcolepsy is a image of excessive sleepiness. Not an individual walking down the street who falls over asleep on the sidewalk. Can that happen? Sure. Is that the best definition of narcolepsy, no. Think of narcolepsy as an individual who can sleep a lot, but never feels like it's creating a stable state of wakefulness. And so I think that if we had a better definition of narcolepsy, we wouldn't have a lot of the problems that we have diagnosing it. In fact, I diagnosed it in a college age uh, woman one time, young woman, and, and she said, oh, it's so funny that that you think I have narcolepsy. Um, I didn't think it, I knew it. Um, anyway, uh, she said, because everybody in college called me narcolepsy girl. And I said, well, did anybody in college ever suggest that maybe you get this profound degree of sleepiness that you've struggled with for years looked at or checked out? And the answer was no. So, that's where we come to this definition of narcolepsy. And we'll get into narcolepsy in future, future episodes. Please, narcolepsy community, this is one of many. So if I fail to touch on something that you deem important, like what happened in our sleep apnea episode, trust me, we, we are not done by this with this topic by a mile. So when you're diagnosed with narcolepsy, you've been diagnosed with a condition that creates a tremendous drive to sleep. It's a sleep drive that really nobody could understand. And so um, 
I want to go to the 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 two songs that I mentioned. Both called Narcolepsy. One by Ben Folds Five in 1999 off the album, something like an unauthorized biography of Reinhold Messner or something like that. The unauthorized. I can't remember the title, but it has nothing to do with Reinhold Messner. who's was an Italian mountain climber. He was the first. He was this. Look him up. He's a stud. He was the first to climb. Uh, Everest uh, solo. He was the first to climb Everest without supplemental oxygen. I mean, the guy just did all kinds of stuff. So I have no idea why the album's called that. But anyway, um, I love one of the lines in the Ben Folds Five narcolepsy song, which says, I know you don't know what I mean yet. So they're talking about the sleepiness, how sleepy I am. And the singer is basically saying, you have no idea what I mean when I say sleepy. So as we start to look at what are the reasons why we have so much difficulty diagnosing this disorder of excessive sleepiness in people, kids too, I think part of it is when a child says to us, I am sleepy, the kid comes home from school, gets off the bus, goes to his bedroom, goes right to sleep, we don't really understand the degree of sleepiness that individual might be going through because we're always seeing it through the lens of our own sleepiness. It's sort of pain, like, oh man, I, I uh, you know, pinched myself, you know, doing something trivial versus passing a kidney stone pain or childbirth pain. These are really two extremely different levels of pain we're talking about here. And I think sleepiness is, is sort of the same, that when we talk about this, we just don't really have great language to describe, I, I'm sleepy, but I don't think you get how sleepy I am. So to me, that's a huge obstacle. And, and that plays into the role of what are we looking for as parents in our children? Well, that's easy. They need to be amazing at ath in athletics. They have to be straight A students and they have to be nice people and they have to be tall and they have to be charitable. I mean, like, I mean, we all have these um, sort of ideals that we hope our children will live up to. I think the one that we start off with, first of all, is, oh, my God, I hope I get a kid who can sleep. So to me, that's first the first thing you're looking for as the child comes out of the birth can, birth canal is you know, how they look. Is they're you know looking pretty good there and get that APGAR score. We've got to nail that APGAR score. That's their first standardized test that they get exposed to. But after that, it really becomes, oh, I hope this baby can 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 nurse. And I hope to God he can sleep. That's what we're looking for. That's what we need right off the bat. Which is interesting because when I when I came to my publisher, who's awesome, I'm give a shout out to Lauren Appleton. She's with uh, Penguin Berkeley now. Um, um, oh, I'm sorry. She, sorry, she is uh, with with Penguin Avery. Um, my previous uh, publisher was Claire with Berkeley now. Both awesome people. Hello to both of you, uh, both of you guys. Uh, when I talked to Lauren about the book, there was a lot of feedback initially, which was kind of I'll paraphrase here. Ah, you know, there's a lot of books out there about kids and sleep. And so I, you know, it's kind of a crowded, crowded spot on the book bookshelf, so to speak. And I remember talking to the to her, my 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 agent, and saying, it's not, it's not crowded at all. What are you what are y'all talking about? Well, you know, like baby wise and Dr. Spock and what to expect when you're expecting and and you can go on and on. I said, well, wait a minute. I said, I want you to think about those books as specifically geared towards getting a child to sleep through the night. And I'll give you a hint. They all do. I've never dealt with a child who's coming to me, you know, 17 year old who came to my clinic and like, well, we read the wrong books. He never slept. We never got him to sleep. I mean, you may not get him to sleep well or on a schedule, but some people like that. You know, one of the interesting criticisms of the rested child was you're putting this value on sleeping on a schedule, sleeping so the parents are happy. Well, what about the kids' needs? Which I think is a very valid point. So what I say to everybody is I'm here to serve you and your family. If your family is existing in this state where all four of your children sleep with you and your partner in the bed 
whenever they want to eat, whenever they want to nap, whenever they want to stay up all night, sleep all night. I, and you're happy with that. I, I've got some thoughts about that, but that's, that's your prerogative. You're the parent here. I'm here to support the individual who may have found themselves in that situation with their kids who needs it not to be that case. So whatever. I said, look, there's not books about sleep in kids out there. And I go, okay, well, great. We'll send us a proposal, write us a sample chapter. And so I did. I wrote a proposal for a book about disorders of sleep in children. And the sample chapter I wrote was chapter seven, the chapter on narcolepsy, because it mattered to me a lot. And I was interested to see what the response was to it. And the response was, dear God, I've never heard of such a thing. This is incredible. People are actually dealing with this. This is a real thing. Is it rare? Is it? A... So all of a sudden we're having a dialogue now that we were not having, you know, week, weeks or months prior, which was ah, more, more baby sleep, kids, books, nap, this schedule. Blah, blah, great. Okay. And again, those books are awesome. They're, they're really helpful to people. But that's not it. That's not what I was intending for the book. So now we've come to the conclusion of, oh wow, this thing exists. Well, why haven't I heard of this? Is it because it's really rare? It's not. When you start stacking up a disorder like narcolepsy, or let's go even bigger, hypersomnia, with other disorders that we see in kids, they 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 match up. They would never be considered rare. One of the titles I thought of for this podcast was narcolepsy, colon, you know these children. They're in your classroom if you're a teacher. They're in your church group if you're a Sunday school instructor. They're on your kids' sports teams. They're in your kids' classrooms. They're they're everywhere. So absolutely they exist. Why do we not see them? Well, that's really... What's so fascinating, isn't it? That's really what I want to talk about with with this topic. So I, I actually today, while I was getting ready to to do this, I actually pulled up headlines for I just looked online for sleep. I just went online, did a Google search for sleep, like news articles. So I'll, I'll tell you a little background about my life. I would say twice a day a reporter will contact me and say, Chris, I'm doing a, a story on sleep masks. Can you help me out? You know, tell me a little bit about them, a little bit of science behind them. Chris, I'm doing a story on uh, uh, five interesting tips to help you beat insomnia. I'm doing one on which, which of all these natural sleep aids, which ones were, I mean, this is, these are the kinds of topics that, that I get. Um, I can tell you, I have never been asked to do, I don't think, any kind of article, newspaper, magazine, media about ex sleep and excessive sleepiness in children never come up. I think I keep track of all the little articles that I participate in. I think I'm somewhere in the 600s right now. Um, none of them have to do with that. So let's look today. Maybe it's just me. Maybe they're asking other sleep or hypersomnia experts to participate in those articles. It's not me. So I pulled up. Just today, um, August 7th, I'm recording. Uh, on CNET, we have the five-minute bedtime ritual that may have cured my sleep troubles. So what's the underlying theme here? Somebody can't sleep. We've talked about that a little bit in few previous episodes. And this guy's figured out a five-minute routine that may have cured it. So I like sleep troubles. What does that mean? Who knows? All right, next article, The Times. Need to cure insomnia? Adam K., on the sleep aids that actually work. So this guy, Adam K. Hey, Adam, uh, welcome into the sleep fold, uh, has tested out the sleep aids and he's gonna tell you in this article which ones work and which ones don't work. Again, interesting, loaded, loaded word there, work. Uh, New York Times, how to sleep like a sleep scientist. So they asked uh, Dr. Lee Irish. She's a sleep researcher up in North Dakota. Hey, Lee. Um, about what she does to sleep her best. And, you know, talked about, you know, winding down in the evening and, and rituals and what her bedroom looks like. Again, what's that underlying message? You're having trouble sleeping. So let's, let's go to the source, man. We're going to Dr. Lee Irish and get it right from her, how you can fix your sleep problems. 
A New York Post, turn your partner's snores into silence with a fitted mouthpiece. And we've talked about CPAP a little bit and sleep apnea. We'll, we'll get into different treatments in the future. Uh, here's on, on Yahoo, Waynesboro man accused of indecent assault during sleep study. Very exciting because I'm coming to you live from Charlottesville. Waynesboro is like 30 minutes from here. So I'm really excited because I think I might know the director of that sleep lab. So, hey, in future episodes, Come here. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna give you the scoop on Waynesboro man. Once we we we'll learn some more information about that. Uh, Science Daily. Don't use booze to help you snooze. I love that rhyme. Uh, Canadian Broadcasting is saying warmer nights caused by climate change will affect Montrealers' sleep. So now we're talking about not being able to sleep. Temperature not helping that. We got Home and Garden. What color helps you sleep? Again, can't sleep. Menopause. Food and drinks to avoid. Should we be drinking tea before bed? Ooh, some deep dive into tea before bed the sleep divorce oh man i got a whole talk i got a whole episode on the sleep divorce i love the idea of a sleep divorce it's not fix the problems it's kick the other person out um and then stanford okay fine here we go stanford's got something oh and it's about kids we got it right here advice to help your kids get enough sleep so i want to end on the stanford headline and they go on and on you're never going to find one about the topic we're talking about today so let's talk about the Stanford one, advice to help your kids get enough sleep. So the message there is there is a problem with kids not getting enough sleep. Sure, there is. Absolutely. Video games and social networks and all kinds of good stuff. School start times. Listen, lots to talk about there. But what about if you have a child that sleeps a lot, that begs for a nap, that always puts himself or herself to bed? Never have to ask them. So let's go back to that baby who's just born and our prayers to the sleep gods that we get a child who's a good sleeper, not a bad sleeper. And we'll talk about that delineation too. I wrote a whole chapter about that in my book, The Rested Child. Again, this is a Chris Winter, DR Chris Winter, uh, Twitter, DR Chris Winter, Instagram, and DR Chris Winter, TikTok. If you're looking for more, more information about the topics we're talking about today, we'll post it all on there. And if you have feedback for the show, uh, criticisms, viewer mail, uh, we'll talk about that as well, too. Oh, we skipped viewer mail today. All right, we'll come back and we'll hit that at the end of the episode. I definitely want to keep our rituals going here. Oh, and just a we're uh, uh, feedback on Jada. No word from Jada yet. She, we talked about her being the only invited guest on the show right now because she appears in all my books for some reason. All right. So again, we're, we're not talking about it. We're putting it out there. Not only we're not talking about it, but the message is always, we're worried about kids not getting enough sleep. So if your baby or your toddler or your preschooler or your early teenager, if that kid is seeking a lot of sleep and sleeping a lot, that must be great. This is a good sleeper. We've 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 hit the jackpot jackpot here, right? So what happens is that child matures and their life starts getting a little bit more complicated, more travel sports, difficult, more difficulty in school, got a girlfriend, boyfriend, partner, whatever you got going on here, uh, singing in an acapella group, volunteering at the soup kitchen, your life is becoming more complicated. And now you're starting to see signs that that child wants more sleep. They're falling asleep in school. They're nodding off as soon as they get home from school and you're having difficulty waking up. They're sleeping entire weekends away. So now that wonderful state of a kid sleeping a ton is becoming problematic. Not doing as well in school. A little message from a teacher. Your child falls asleep in school quite a bit. Or the school nurse, every hypersomnia child has a relationship with the school nurse. And it's usually a lovely one. Oh God, the school nurse saved my life. She would allow me to come to her office during my study hall and sleep. And that's the only reason I got through high school. So now there is conflict happening. So what happens when there is some sort of conflict of sleep? My child's sleeping all the time. I'm worried about her. Well, you got to take him to the doctor. Okay. So we can see the problem, but it often doesn't happen until later. And the later is often 10 to 15 years from the time your child is noted to be excessively sleepy to the time that they get the proper diagnosis of hypersomnia, narcolepsy, whatever it turns out to be, a decade. 
Why? Number one, we don't know it's a problem. Where is that news article that's coming at us all the time, making us aware of, yeah, here's the great pillow you can use, and here's some in information about a sleep divorce, and here's revenge procrastination, here's the top 10 sleep masks for your next whatever. Where's that information about? Be careful. Look for these warning signs of excessive sleepiness in your children. Be on the lookout for these things because they're out there. They're everywhere. And the early recognition and the early treatment is everything to these kids. It's everything to these kids. Um, you know, it's interesting. One of the lines in that Ben Folds 5 song I wrote down was, I know it seems like I don't care. And what they're referring to is, it seems like I don't care about that thing, but I do. I'm just too tired to show it, which I think is is really profound. So what do we do? We're going to take our kid to the doctor. That's going to solve everything, right? No. It's not going to solve everything because, number one, most primary care doctors are not asking about sleep. Okay, that's okay, but we've because we've recognized it now. Our kid is falling asleep all over the place. And, and we, we don't need the doctor to recognize it. We don't need the doctor to ask us. We're going to bring it to our doctor. We're taking it to our pediatrician. But there's a very good chance your pediatrician has never gotten really any training on sleep, certainly not on narcolepsy. Their training has some, something to do with melatonin gummy bear. And I've never really been able to figure out exactly what they're doing when it comes to sleep. But there's a very good chance that there's going to be several things involved here. Some blame. You got to get your kids sleep a little bit better. You know, you stayed up too late. Does you, do, you, do you have video games? Oh, they're in your bedroom. Well, you probably need to take those out. Well, probably a good idea, but that's not what's going on here. So we have a fundamental education problem. Your pediatrician has not gotten really any training on sleep. The other thing is I want you to think about this individual that I'm going to describe to you. They're tired all the time. Uh, they they skip out on fun activities to spend time in their bedroom, often to sleep in bed. Sometimes we'll sleep entire weekends away. Lethargic, not engaged, down. Sounds like depression, doesn't it? So the other thing that creates such a problem here with sleepy children is they they often get routed towards incorrect diagnoses or incomplete diagnoses. Maybe your child is depressed. That's fine. But I don't think that's the reason why they can't stay awake during a baseball game. I've had children go into the dugout and just fall asleep on the bench. And nobody really seems to, to wonder about that. Or a kid who falls asleep every day in class. Well, what are you doing about that? Well, we, we contact the parents that maybe needs to get a little bit more sleep. Well, again, there's that blame thing again. So they get shunted down the pathway of depression, anxiety, ADHD is a big one. What do we do when we treat ADHD? We give stimulants. So guess what happens? It kind of works. Oh, we did it. Oh, your child was having trouble paying attention in school and we gave them a little bit of a, a stimulant and look how great they are right now. Well, awesome, but you're just waking them up a little bit with the stimulant. Not, you're not addressing the fundamental problem here. So. Even if you can get your kid to a sleep doctor, there was a study that said basically 50% of sleep doctors don't really feel comfortable treating narcolepsy. You know, there's not that many of us around that are MD, sleep doctors, board certified sleep physicians. And you're going to cut that number in half because 50% of people who have sleep doctor written on their door are not interested or able to treat your, your kid, that's terrible. I find the treatment of narcolepsy to be absolutely enchanting. I love it. I love treating narcolepsy patients because we can make such a big difference. And if we can get them early enough, radically change their lives. One of the things that I always say is a great indicator that you might be dealing with somebody, an adult who has narcolepsy is... On that little sheet that they fill out when they come see you, they've written something like some college. I find that so interesting, some college. Um, so I think it's really important that we understand that individuals who have 
some college, you got to ask, why'd you stop? And a lot of times it's because their sleepiness became overwhelming. So it's a massive disability because parents don't really see it. Teachers don't see it. Doctors don't see it. The media doesn't see it. It's not interesting to them. So the parting thought here, and, I, and I'm going to bring in some viewer mail, and I'm going to give a shout out to Nicole Shallow. Nicole Shallow, she is at Your Behavior Gal. And that's the British spelling of behavior, which is so much better than the English. Uh, she's on Instagram, Your Behavior Gal. She wrote because somebody posted, um, Karen Berry posted, no kid should be diagnosed with ADHD without a sleep evaluation. So I'd put that in my book, The Rested Child. And she posted that and said, yes. And then your behavioral, your behavior gal said, I think this is an interesting point And one I think is constantly missed by most diagnosing pr practitioners. So here's the bottom line. And again, if you are a narcolepsy advocate looking for more about narcolepsy, it's coming. Trust me, how we diagnose it, the mistakes we make, the pitfalls in treatment, it's all coming. But right now, the simple message is this. Do not let these groups that I've just named ignore the sleepiness that you're feeling, that someone you love is feeling, or that someone you know is feeling. Because we all know these people. There is somebody at your office right now that every Friday during the staff meeting falls asleep. Talk to that patient privately, kindly, supportively. What's going on, man? Why are you having so much difficulty staying awake? If your kids are having trouble staying awake in school, before you go down the depression pathway, before you go down the ADHD pathway, I think it is perfectly reasonable to say to that provider, I'm concerned about excessive sleepiness or narcolepsy. How, what, what do you think about a sleep evaluation before we go down these things? I think if your doctor says, eh, I don't think a sleep eva evaluation is a good idea, get another doctor. What's wrong with that? One of two things are going to happen. Your child's going to come see one of us and we're going to say, no, your sleep looks great. Or, whoa, your sleep is really bad. And one last note, you can't rely too much on what your kid is saying. Just this week, I saw a 17-year-old with excessive sleepiness. Her mother, God bless her, figured it out. And the mother was the one who got her out of the sleep study. And I asked her, what happened during your sleep study? She said, I, I slept fine. She goes, but I, I had trouble taking naps the next day. So we do these little nap tests we'll talk about in later episodes that sort of help determine the degree of sleepiness. Bottom line was she didn't think she fell asleep in any of the naps. She fell asleep in all the naps and it never took her more than about two minutes to do it. So we have to be very careful about asking kids and fully relying on what they're reporting because when she went home after the test, she told her mom, I didn't sleep during the naps. So it, sleepiness is important. It's just as important as an inability to sleep, even though the inability to sleep, the problem sleeping, the sleep mask, the menopause, the what color to paint your bed, all that stuff gets the attention. So look around. If that is something that you are dealing with, love to hear about it. But I really want you to be an advocate for that person. Talk to your doctor. And if your doctor doesn't seem to really understand what's going on or is patting you on the head, mom or dad, and telling you, kids are tired. It's okay. That's what happens when you're a teenager. It's the hormones. Oh, God. Go find another doctor. Go contact a sleep specialist. They're out there. They can get your kid the help they need and radically change their lives. And we'll talk about some of the great things that I've seen over the years. My favorite, and I, I wrote about it in my book, was a young woman who we diagnosed fairly young, and she sent me her college transcript and said, I want you to see how my grades improved all along as you were treating me. I could never have graduated college without you. So sleepiness is important, even though we don't pay attention to it. That's the message for today. Thanks for tuning in. We'll put some extra stuff on um, the my social media, including what's going on with Waynesboro Man uh, and that sleep 
sleep clinic situation. Uh, Dr. Chris Winter Twitter, uh, Dr. C H R I S W N T E R. Also, Dr. Chris Winter Instagram, uh, Dr. Chris Winter TikTok. Uh, my books, The Sleep Solution: Why Your Sleep's Broken and How to Fix It, uh, and The Rested Child, which we talked a little bit about today: Why You're Tired, Why Your Irritable Child May Have a Sleep Disorder, and How to Help. Thank you very much for making this so much fun. I appreciate everybody out there giving me feedback, following the podcast, sharing it with people. Um, I think that's really the big the big thing that's happening now. As I talk to people and see the numbers of this podcast go up, I really think it's because maybe you don't have the excessive sleepiness in your family, but you know somebody who does and you're sending these podcasts out to those people and say, look, you need to listen to this because I think it affects your son or your daughter. Anyway, that's it. We'll talk to you on uh, next Monday for the next episode of Sleep Unplugged. Until then, sleep well.